When um, Absolutely Fabulous started, it was really meant to be a mother and daughter sitcom. And then, mm. as the years went by, it morphed into a, a sitcom about friendship. Mm. And how did that emerge? Was it just... How did... Were you involved in the evolution of Patsy? No. Not really. I was just Patsy. But I think Jennifer liked the Patsy who began appearing, and she couldn't resist writing stuff for her because she realised that <clears throat> with Patsy who, after all, hasn't eaten since 1974 and has had all her organs removed. So there's almost nothing that can kill her or affect her. She, she's like a cartoon character. And so there's no reason why Patsy shouldn't have taken a few hormones and let, gone down to Morocco and had something stitched on. And how, after a year, with a slight moustache, it fell off, and then she just came back and became a woman again. I mean, you can do that if you're Patsy, and she just could morph in and out of things. She stuck. She said she was always 39. We've seen them old, but they never seemed... I wanted Patsy again to, to have that kind of almost cartoonish quality of always having her hair, red mouth, hair up. Because um, Brian Ricks once said to me, I was in a comedy with Brian Ricks, playing a small part on stage, the Garrick Theatre, my first play in the West End. And I asked for a dress. I said, Brian, this is three months later. Three months later, do you think that Miss Parkin should have a new dress. He said, no, don't change your clothes. The audience won't know who you are. And I thought, ooh, crikey. So that's a bit of a lesson. Try to stay the same. And in comedy, try to present kind of roughly the same person. So that's one of Patsy's successes, her hairdo. Hugely uh, popular with the LGBT community, obviously, yeah. Patsy and Nadina. And you got the freedom. I think it was the, the gay community in New York were the first people oh, yeah. to properly embrace them, embrace those characters, weren't they? And give, didn't you get the freedom of New York? We for... did. We got the freedom. I'm an... I have the freedom of New York till I fall down dead. And it was really from the LGBT mayor of the time. Uh, it, it was very touching, it was extraordinary. I think it's because we'd managed to, Jennifer, weed. Jennifer had written in, she was c color blind against casting. She didn't give a damn how people were. Um, she didn't give a damn any shortfalls. One of our actors had got a leg missing, didn't Chris, who always played it with a limp because he had lost a leg in a motorbike accident. We had every colour under the sun, and she also had um, every kind of every kind of liaison. She was always longing for Safi to be a lesbian. She was always longing for... She was so thrilled that her son Serge was gay. So thrilled. And when she found him, he was wearing a little cardigan like Safi and was a little dull boy. She was furious and preferred his very gay and flamboyant friend. So we crossed all kind of boundaries, made everything perfectly acceptable. And this transgender thing, which rather jumped the gun, I think. Shall we have a little look at uh, Patsy in action? The joy, I have to say, the joy of this show was that it was June, the five J's, which was Jennifer and Joanna, June, Julia, and Jane Horrocks. We used to just, on, honestly in rehearsals, just cry with laughter, but June Whitfield, is she not gold? Now, Dame June Whitfield, thank goodness. June, who is quite small, is now that big. Absolutely in perfect order, all marbles there, completely perfect, except I can pick her up like that now. <laughs> Just divine. And working with Julia Sawala, I tell you, she's, she, A, she's got a photographic memory, so she just looks at a page and she's got the whole lot. B, she never corpses, never, unlike Jennifer, never corpses, unlike Jane Horrocks, who once she starts can't be stopped. Um, just magic girl. And little, little dull little Safi, who I'm afraid to say a lot of men find rather attractive. Um, little Safi like that. When you meet Julia, she's so different. Heels that high hair up all on one side, lipstick across here. She's extraordinary. So to have sustained Safi for 25 years is quite something. Fabulous. Well, we're now going to move on to what we in television sexually call non-scripted programming. Yeah. Um, uh, so if you're not a TV executive, and I know there are some people here who aren't uh, in the television industry, that's basically documentaries of anything or anything that's not made up. So it uh, covers a whole multiple of sins, as we know, from across programmings to entertainment uh, to Love Island. Have you watched Love Island? I, f I feel I have. <laughs> I ha no, I haven't. I, not, not because I didn't want to, I haven't. You haven't? You never, never? Because I'm so busy. Yeah, of course. Now, so... I'm not against it. But you have uh, recently, well, no, over the years, have got 
into doing you've done travel programs for a long time but mm. you've, you've you've been doing a lot of them in the last in the last few years mm. and i have made a lot of them with you and everyone people often say to me if you if ever it's anyone who says, oh what do you do clive and i say oh i i make um travel documentaries and they say oh anything with you i say oh, I, I make joanna lumley's <gasps> Did you make Northern Lights? <laughs> That's the one I didn't make, and it's always the one that's uh, mentioned. But we did make together uh, Girl Friday, mm. which was, uh, we filmed 25 years ago, next February. Uh, in And uh, we took you to a desert island, and uh, you had to survive for 10 days. I was a quite young, inexperienced producer. Weirdly, I was thinking back now, I was 31, I think, at the time, and... It was a BBC One Hour, and I was in Janet Street Porter's department, and they said, do you know Janet? I'm like, oh, yes, I've worked with her. I've done one sketch. And so, and then nowadays, I don't think anybody in the BBC will probably wouldn't nowadays give me, even now, give me the, that uh, responsibility. But we went off to a desert island, and uh, I, then I was quite, I remember going to an early meeting, and I was, the, it wasn't my idea. Another executive had come up with the idea. Joanna Lumley smiles on desert island. And I said, and how will it be? And they said, oh, it'd be so funny. So, Pat, but Abfab had just started, had just taken off, and we'll see Joanna on the desert island with a bottle of champagne and heels, and then she'd be like, oh, how will I survive, and stuff like that. So I wrote out sort of a mini script, anyway. And then I went to see Joanna, and I said, well, we thought we'd see it with you with us on the desert island with a glass of champagne and high heels. She fixed me with that look that junior ministers <laughs> who've dealt with her over the Gurkhas know and fear. She said, we will not be doing that. <laughs> will we, Clive? <laughs> and I said, no, no. She wanted to, quite rightly, do it normally, play it straight, go onto a desert island. And uh, it was pre I'm a Celebrity, Get Me Out of Here, uh, Survivor, The mm. Island, all mm. those programmes that have followed, of which makes me feel a bit stupid, obviously, because I probably could have formatted it and, 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 uh, and made lots and lots of money. But what was that experience like for you? Obviously, I know what it was like as the as the... Well, I was the first of four of those programmes you made, yeah. and the other were Lenny, Lenny Henry, yeah. Billy Connolly, yeah. and Ross Kemp, weren't yeah. they? So those are f pr f pretty roughy tufty boys, and me is the first one. None of the other three could survive with what life had given me to survive on. A ha one pound of rice. Oh, look. This shows how important this was. I keep practically nothing from any of my life. I've been working 50 years in the business. I keep the odd script and odd bits and pieces. From Girl Friday, it was such a colossal part of my life that I knew it would have changed me forever, which it did. So I kept things like um, one pound of rice. This is what I survived on, just that, for the whole week. There was no fruit on the island. There's no food on t 10 days. Yeah. That's all. And to eat that, I had a rusty tin, which I haven't brought with me, but I had a shell to eat it with because I didn't have a spoon or a fork, and I had a shell to eat it out of. That's my spoon shell. Um, I had a ladle to take stuff out, which I made from a coconut shell, which I screwed together and tied with this. I'd had what they called training before I'd gone on. I went down to the Irish Guards at Purbright, and training on television, as you know, is being seen to be training. You don't actually do it. You sit down there and I go, hmm, and watch with a whole lot of soldiers, watching them sieving water through charcoal and socks. And you go, hmm, and then they go, come on. You go, I haven't learned this. And you go, just come on. How to make a fire and a thing. And you go, I haven't learned this. Come on. So I had no training at all, but I had an SAS handbook and a little tin of what the SAS had given me. Three um, light matches which would light in a monsoon, but don't use them. Two anodin in case I felt ill. A curved needle in case I cut my arm open so I could suture myself up again. A big knife um, and a small knife. I had to give the small knife back again. But I think, I, oh no, I've got my small knife here. I kept these things because I thought nobody will ever believe me. My granddaughters won't believe me. That's my knife. And most important, Clive, I know you want to ask me this. Now, wait for the, this is the... This, oh, Clive, this, let me tell them, let tell me tell them. them. Because this next moment, I yeah. think... Possibly, uh, my whole career has been built on this next moment, uh, and uh, so let's uh, let's see the VT from this.
We had to record. I had to record. I'm completely non-techy, but they give me a camera, and every night I had to prop it up, hope I was in vision, and do my recordings, um, and then switch it off again. It was incredibly tough. It was thrilling, but it was incredibly tough. And my biggest fear was trench foot, because my feet were so soft, and the inside of the cave was like, um, because it was volcanic rock, it was like razor blades. And so this was necessity being the mother of invention. Now, in those days, I had a bra. Can I, can I do my story go on, now? Go on this was my bra from Marks and Spencers, um, and it fastened at the front. So that was it. And I knew that if I undid it like that, I could see, you can see already, how that folded over could make a little thing. And if I cut it there, I would be able to wrap that over my shoe. These are the only things I've asked to be buried with me when I die. <laughs> there they are. <laughs> these, these are the very little shoes I made. And the extraordinary thing was, is because this happens when you're up against it. I only had a certain amount of twine, which they thought I would do fishing with. And I didn't do that thing of plunging onto one shoe. I thought each shoe must have exactly the same amount. So I measured the twine and cut it exactly in half. I had my needle for sewing up my arm. And then all I needed was just to think, just to think about it. Honestly, just adore. Do, just, you can just have a moment of adoring. OK, that's the end of that. I'm going to put them away. But these things I keep with me. That was my mic. It's because I haven't been trained long in television. Um, <laughs> these things I keep because it's very easy to forget, and either to exaggerate or underestimate what you did. It was the toughest thing I've ever done, and the happiest, because I realized after that, because after such a short time, I could tell, I could smell when the, when the rain was coming. Three minutes to come to the rain, I could smell. I could hear when the tide was turning. I knew, after only four, five, six days alone on the island, I knew when the, so my animal instincts were just Maybe very close these, to the surface. Just put the knife away. Them, no, put the knife <laughs> um, it was just very comforting, and I thought, if I fall down dead, there's no real problem. You just get washed away into the sea. So uh, this is my short lesson today. Don't be afraid of dying. Okay, that's the end of that. Okay. <laughs> Doesn't seem to close that one. No, it doesn't close. Good. <laughs> Well, oh, I loved it. No, anyway, Clive, I loved it. I loved that trip. I loved it. I loved it. I loved having to live off nothing but lime squeezed onto that. There was one lime tree. I loved the feeling of um, being alone, where you have no clothes, you've got no choices, you've got nothing to lock up. You own nothing. There's nobody there to steal it. So something, the burdens that we carry about today, all of us today on our shoulders, have we locked the car? Have we got our phones? Is the phone switched off? Have we got this? Where do we park? What are we going to eat? Have I got enough money? All those things. There's, there's none. You have nothing. You are nobody. You're on an island where there never has been a language. You name them places. I called it the Albert Hall because my husband was conducting Kirita Kanoa at the Albert Hall while I was away in, in, in this northwest island off the northwest coast of Madagascar. I called things the old grumpy old man. I called things the ship beach and things like that. I could name them. They were my places. And you have to name things because here in Scotland in particular, you come over and you go, have they really called that little bump of hill a name? And the answer is yes, because if your sheep are lost or if there's a tree down or if there's a flood in the valley, you've got to know exactly where it is. For survival, you've got to have names. That's why human beings are mad about names. When we can't think up new names, we take the old names with us, hence New York. Do you um, want me to shut this now or not? Yeah, I don't know how to do it. I think well, I you do, go. you there just you do that. The, um, <laughs> and that's why you survived. We, um, uh, it was obviously a phenomenal success, Girl Friday. It went out, it got like 15 million viewers the night it went out, Whoa. Uh, which is amazing. But it was also partly because Alan Yentob had moved it at the last minute. It was meant to go out on a Wednesday night and it moved to Saturday night. And it, was, it went out the night, it went out after the second ever lottery. And I don't know if those of us who remember when the lottery started, the whole nation stopped because we all thought we were going to win. So we inherited like probably 30 million viewers. But anyway, it, was, it did phenomenally well and people remember it to this day. You've now gone on to do lots of travel mm. shows. And I believe there's a very good series about to come out on Why, ITV. Clive, there is. And how <laughs> lovely that you produced it. September the 12th. And I've, made by Burning Bright Productions, which I've heard are very good. Um, <laughs> Shall we have a little look yes. at uh, the new series? What, what, this is what? What are we, we seeing? Uh, this is the Silk Road where we've filmed. Joanna has filmed four episodes. Four episodes from Venice to China. We have spent most of the summer making it. In fact, we spent most of the summer sitting next to each other in a car. And I was joking backstage that 
most of the time when sitting next to each other over the last four weeks, we've literally fallen asleep as we, and then stood up, oh, isn't Kyrgyzstan lovely? And then we'll fall <laughs> But um, this is a little clip, mainly of some, some of the scenes in episodes two and four, because for complicated reasons, we're editing it out of order. But uh, so this was something that we uh, made just to show people some sort of essence of the new series. So if we could roll that VT, that'd be great. Hello, ladies. <gasps> oh, look, gosh, she's got, look how, look how shiny. Yagrezba, chorta normo, panjota ginon, dusata non brot. The smell here when they're setting up for the new baking. <gasps> I know. <laughs> I can't tell you how good it is. It's very dense. Please come through. It's very thick, dense, so it's not light and furry and airy. What sort of personality does this bird have? Is she a good girl? Character is a Japanese and the Although beautiful Bishke, capital of Kyrgyzstan, is now a city of over a million and a quarter people, in the old days when it was part of the Sogdian Empire, it was just a simple trading post on the important Silk Road, travelling from China all the way across to the east. And, and, and whilst it was very, very green, very, very green city, holy smoke. And, I'm guessing this is where all the action takes place. <gasps> Look, silk, silkworms, cocoons. <sighs> Look at that lovely little creature. These little darlings have made people richer than a king's ransom just by producing what's natural to them and to us is desired. Silk. I'm wearing one as a brooch because I've become very attached to him. Follow me on my Silk Road adventure. Why do you love doing those travel documentaries? Because they're quite hard work. I mean, I mean obviously accompanying you, I know that, you know, 14 hour days, you don't have anyone doing your hair and makeup. There's only five of us. You nearly, quite often, you get up an hour or so before us. You come down in the morning. We're all sitting there having breakfast. After about four or five minutes, you sort of stamp your foot and say, what do you think about today's outfit? And usually it's me and the cameraman or something. We all look at and go, oh yeah, it's great, it's great. But so rude, I tell you, working with men all the time, they just don't care. And you go, I wore this yesterday, but I had something slightly different. Do you think that around the neck works better? Or do you think, they go, yeah, well, whatever. And it's not what you wanted. Um, and I have to remember whether, you know, sometimes you have to shoot things out of order. Would I have had that on or off? Anyway, it doesn't really matter. Nobody really notices, as Clive has pointed out. Nobody's looking at me. <laughs> and um, uh, the days are long, but there's something quite extraordinary about the, the open road. Those, there are those of us who are homebodies and those of us who are travellers. Most of us have got a bit of each. And I love being at home, making home a nice place. But I love the white road winding. And there's something about particularly this particular story of the Silk Roads. Silk Roads, because as uh, both Peter Frankopan and Colin Thubron have pointed out, there was no road. There was just a series of interconnected routes through which trade flowed over land, and of course down by water as well. But we were concentrating on, the, on this central bit coming silk, because it was started in China, going all the way across to Europe, where people were waiting like this for this fabulous quality stuff. But of course, coming from Europe was going stuff that China wanted. 
and particularly from the middle of uh, Kyrgyzstan a Valley, the Fergana Valley, the horses there were called the horses of heaven to the Chinese. So they would trade bolts of silk for the horses and so on. Absolutely phenomenal, phenomenal story. And Central Asia was a part of the world I longed to visit. I longed to visit. So when we were given permission to do the Silk Road adventure, we call it that because so we've had to this is history, this is centuries of stuff, centuries of stories through eight different countries. And uh, so we could, you always hate me saying this, it's like a pe pebble skimming, it isn't quite like that. But we drop in on certain things that might be interesting, might be interesting, might be interesting. What is interesting is seeing the silkworms. To hold those little creatures and to hear them eating. They said, when the, silk, when the silkworms eat, it sounds like the sea. So he brought the, the sound man and just said, listen. And he put up his microphone and there was the sound of, no, rain, rain the rain yeah. falling. <laughs> Millions of little mouths <laughs> eating, eating, eating marlboros. Well, we've actually run out of time. Oh, no, the, stop. I know, Don't make you me go. Wouldn't, you wouldn't he stop. always does this. He goes, you've had enough. You've just winding up. Um, we, the app has started to work. Very, there's a few questions. Uh, somebody, Kevin from ITV, will you do 10 part series next year? No, Thanks, that's not Kevin. Good. Charlotte, uh, Ben from Channel 5, I love you more than all of them. Yeah, well, that's just silly, these are questions. Um, well, let me take one question. Um, you've been shooting since the 1960s mm. uh, in, on television. What's the biggest industry change that, uh, since you've started out? Oh, for sure, working on video. I mean, in the old days, you had to take cans and cans of film. And if you were lucky, if you were filming abroad, and you'd be the rushes to take back to England. And so you'd arrive at Heathrow and somebody would come and collect the rushes and take them back for them to be... Nobody knew what they had on camera. So now, directors can sit at the corner and they're seeing this, they're looking quite often. In the old days, they'd stand behind the cameraman and see if what they wanted is shown. Now, they just sit in a corner and watch it. So they know what they're getting. So I swear this is the biggest difference. It's the same with our, our little cameras. I mean, the difference between, hello, Whitehall 1392, and what we have now yeah. is just immeasurably different. So I would say in technology is the biggest difference. And also how mean they've got. When I was in the Bond film, I only had two lines. We were on it for two months. Now, I sometimes play a name above the title and I'm on it for three days. So it's just different, that's all. Well, um, I shouldn't have said mean, should I? You shouldn't have said no, mean, okay, you shouldn't sorry. have ended like that. That was no. annoying, that was very annoying. <laughs> well, um, of it. We, no, uh, I'd, I'd, like to, uh, I'd like to thank uh, Edinburgh TV Festival for inviting us. I'd like to thank Phil and Lisa for uh, making it all happen. Yeah. And uh, please all go and listen to Michaela Cole this evening. I think she's going to be amazing. She's going to be here. Yeah. And so that's going to be fabulous. And uh, I thought the best way to end it, I wondered what uh, Jennifer and Joanna or Patsy and Adina would be like when they were old. And then I, when I was looking through AbFab clips, I found this last clip. So uh, let's uh, quickly look at what uh, Jennifer and Joanna, Patsy and Adina will be like in 30 years time. Not dead yet. <laughs> no, no, not dead yet. Thank you.